Salutations, my name is Kevin Garcia, and I am a mythology geek. I'll take it. I just love world religions, ancient religions. They have gods of everything, gods of war, gods of love, gods of flowers, gods of whatever. But the best gods are the party gods, the gods of drunkenness and drinking and revelry, and that's who we're going to cover tonight. Let's start with the most famous, because Greek life is party life. So about 4,000 years ago, Zeus sees this human woman, Semele, and she just finished murdering a bull, slaughtering a bull, cleaned the blood off her body in a river, and this must have been really, really hot because Zeus immediately turned into an eagle, flew down, and seduced her. <sighs> now, those of you guys who only know Hera through the Disney movie, uh, you should probably check out the slightly more accurate Kevin Sorbo version because Hera really, really, really hates all of Zeus's bastard children. When she found out Semele was pregnant, she tricked Semele into asking a favor of Zeus. Semele was like, hey Zeus, show me your real power. And Zeus was like, baby, you couldn't handle my real power. Then you must not love me. <sighs> okay, fine. And that was the end of Semele. <laughs> but Zeus was thinking fast, cut open his leg, took the fetus out, put it inside his leg, sewed his leg up. When the baby finally came to term, they called it twice born because obviously. Now, <laughs> Zeus is all about baby making, but he's not so much on baby rearing. So he took the baby, gave it to Hermes. Hermes gave it to the king, Athamas. Athamas gave it to his second wife, Eno. Eno took the baby boy, dressed it up as a girl to trick Hera. That did not work. Uh, Hera made Athamas and Eno go insane and murder their own children. Don't feel too bad for them, though, because Eno, her children, and even Semele all got to be gods later on. Not Athamas. He just got married again and had more kids. <clears throat> so Zeus had his son taken away so he could be safe somewhere else. He went off to the land of Nisa, and that is either Africa or Asia, depending on who you ask. While he was there, he met the jolly old god, Selenus, and Selenus taught him about wine and winemaking and drinking, and this is when Twiceborn finally became the god of Nisa, Dionisa. Yeah, like a, that's what that means. <laughs> to be fair, that particular translation comes from probably a few thousand years after these stories started, so they could have been back translating how they wanted to. Um, this is from, I think, early Rome, I think, when that translation comes in. All right, so Dionysus, his posse, his people, are called the Theasus. And the Theasus includes a whole bunch of people. Uh, the Maenads, who were nymphs and human women who got really drunk and just stayed wild for the rest of their lives. Uh, satyrs, goat-like people. The Silenae, which are Silenus's horse-like people, depending on who you ask. And then Dion, you know what, let's just call him Dion, it's just easier. So Dion's son, Priapus. Um, Priapus was cursed with, if you don't know what Priapism is, look it up. Uh, to make Priapus feel better, Dion gave his son a talking donkey. Um, surprisingly, this didn't work uh, because as Priapus was trying to hit on this nice looking nymph, uh, the donkey interrupted and ruined any chances of anything ever happening, so he killed the donkey. All right. So, uh, oh, by the way, don't feel bad about the donkey. Donkey got to be a constellation, so. Mm -hmm. All right. So, uh, Dion then travels around the world some more, comes back to Greece, uh, gets uh, made insane a couple times by Hera. Uh, he runs afoul of some kings that don't like his partying ways. So in response, Dion makes them go insane and kill their children. Don't mess with drunk gods, okay? Um, later on, Dion becomes the god Bacchus in Rome. His maenads become the Bacchae. His Dionysa celebrations became Bacchanalias. And by the way, if you've never been to a real Bacchanalia, they're great. Everyone gets so drunk, they tear apart live animals, then eat them flesh raw, or so I've heard. Um, <clears throat> all right, before I move on, I wanted to mention one story that I'm sure you've all heard before. So, Silenus's dad, Pan, was also a member of the Theasus. And Pan, famous, by the way, for teaching mankind the true meaning of self-love, um, fell in love with a nymph, but she rejected him. She ran away and hid by transforming herself into a reed. He chopped those reeds down and turned them into his flute. This will be relevant in a second. All right. So let's move off to Latin America uh, with the rabbits, all 400 of them. 
And if that sounds familiar to you, there is a place uh, at the Alamo Draft House, Slaughter Lane, right? Let's get to what that name means. All right. So when the universe was young, Quetzalcoatl, the feathered serpent, saw that there was no plant that could make mankind happy. So as the wind god Hecatl, he went to go seek out the virgin goddess Mayahuel, and together they went to seek a plant, but in the process fell in love. This annoyed the grandmother goddess Tzitzimitl. She, yeah, try saying these names. She <laughs> was trying to protect the honor of Mayahuel. So Hecatl and Mayahuil fled to earth, disguised themselves as a plant. Zitzimitl realized she was too late, sent her Zitzimeme demons to chop up the plant, cut it down. Hecatl got away just fine, but when he came back, he saw Mayahuil was in pieces. Where he buried her bones, the first Mage plants grew. Don't feel bad for her, because while she stopped being a virgin goddess, she got to become a mother goddess. With her husband, the god of drunkenness, Petacatl, she had 400 children, which she took care of with her 400 breasts. I should point out that for Mesoamerica, the number 400 is like saying millions and millions and millions because it just means a big number. So she might as well have had infinite children and infinite breasts. The milk, however, was pulque. Hmm. I actually thought about going into the origin of wine and other things I'm going to talk about, but I figure most of you guys know how wine is made. It hasn't really changed in thousands of years. But if you don't know what pulque is, there are farmers called tachiqueros, and they will go to the maguey plants, and they will collect the sap of that plant they call aja miel, or honey water. They will allow it to ferment, and it becomes this milky, white, alcoholic drink called pulque. Now, according to folk tradition, some farmers were out one day, and they saw some rabbits that had all passed out near a plant. And the first thing the farmers thought was, I got to drink what those rabbits drink. <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, if I see a bunch of passed out animals, I want to eat whatever they ate because I'm sure it's healthy. Um, according to another tradition, only the Aztec kings were allowed to drink pulque. According to yet another tradition, the Virgen de Guadalupe is also tied to this in that she is also called the mother of Mage and that pulque is called milk of the virgin. So there's that. So there's 400 rabbits called the Zentontotoshtin. I'm going to say a lot of words today, and if you can speak these languages better than me, let me know. So the Zentontotoshtin, the 400 rabbits, each represent a specific type of drunkenness or a reason to get drunk or one of the results of drinking, good or bad. So they each have different names. Um, one of them is called Two Rabbit. His name is Tepo Stecatl. And, and by the way, Mesoamerican names tend to be tied to a day name which is a number with one of about 20 nouns. So he is two rabbit, Mayahuel is one rabbit, I am six jaguar, goes on like that. Tepesocatl is a god of drunkenness, a god of the moon, and a culture hero. When his people were conquered in a war, they were forced to give one old man a year to be fed to the feathered serpent of their rivals. So Tepesocatl disguised himself, although very young, he disguised himself as an old man, went down to earth, Volunteered his tribute. And when the feathered serpent appeared, he killed it. Now just imagine that. A god comes to earth as a carpenter and dies for his people, but then murders the devil right off. <laughs> Five of those other gods are called the Maquilton Al Let's try that again. Ooh, I love that. Nice. All right, so these gods uh, were collectively the gods of pleasure, and they were uh, five rabbit and five grass and five lizard and five vultures, god of gluttony, and five flower, also known as Ahui Tioto. Um, Ahui Tioto is the god of voluptuousness, which really confused the hell out of me because my whole life I thought that word meant something else. Turns out voluptuous means indulging in pleasure, which now makes a lot more sense. Uh, so... Ahui Teoto also hangs out with his brothers, Xochipili, and this is the one name that I don't feel brave enough to try to say. Ixtlilton? I have no idea what Ahui Teoto is doing, but he's probably living up to his title. <laughs> now, the 400 rabbits are often shown with these moon-shaped rings in their noses, uh, possibly because they are connected to the moon, but also possibly because they are connected to another Aztec goddess, Tlazio Teoto. Now, she is often considered a love goddess or a goddess of pleasure, but... One of her other titles 
really clarifies who she is. The other title is The Eater of Filth. Um, she represents all of the really dirty things humans do to each other. Uh, let's just say if the, the Bacchanalia was weird, the stuff that the Aztecs will do would make Leatherface and Hannibal Lecter blush. <laughs> Leave it at that. Moving on. <clears throat> now, while the Greeks and Aztecs had whole cults devoted to gods of drunkenness, all the Norse gods were drunk, like all the time. <laughs> Their drink of choice was mead, which I'm sure you know already. Honey plus water plus yeast plus whatever else for flavoring. The greatest of all mead makers was Aegir, god of the sea. Aegir and his nine daughters, each of whom are named after a type of wave, I'm not going to try, <laughs> would throw occasional parties, allowing the Asgardians in to enjoy the mead and, and, and have a good time. The nine daughters, by the way, had a son, Heimdall. So that means that big guy that can see everything, he had nine virgin mothers. Now, by the way, uh, some people will say that because Heimdall's mothers have slightly different names in one story than Ager's daughters in a different story, that they may be different people. But Ager himself has like 10 names, so why can't his kids? All right. So Odin loved these parties. He loved the mead, and he wanted his people to have this mead all the time. Ager said he could, but he couldn't get a cauldron big enough because the gods could drink the ocean. So he sent Thor on a mission. Thor's job was to find a cauldron big enough to prepare mead for the gods. There was a story of Hymir, a giant who had a cauldron that was a mile deep and a mile wide, and Thor went to go get it. Now, Hymir was not eager to give it away, but he would if Thor could prove he was the better man. He invited Thor to dinner, became an eating contest. By the time Hymir was still halfway through his first cow, Thor had already eaten two oxen and was still hungry. So they went fishing, became a fishing contest. Hymir caught two whales, but Thor caught Hormungandr? World serpent. World serpent. Basically, it's a snake that wraps around the entire earth. And as Thor tried to pull it up, he nearly destroyed the planet. So Hymir cut the line, ended that contest. Finally, Hymir came up with a better plan, and he said, all right, fine. This is a glass that cannot be broken. I am the only one strong enough to break this glass. You're welcome to try. So Thor gave it his best. He smashed it, he bashed it, he tried to crash into it, nothing happened. Finally, Hymir's wife was tired of this measuring contest and told Thor, just throw it at him. So Thor did. Smashed right against his head, broke into a million little pieces. Sure enough, Hymir was the only one that could break it. <laughs> Thor won the contest, he got to keep the cauldron, brought it back, Ager was willing to throw more parties. At one of these parties, Ager met Bragi, god of poetry. And Ager says, all right, tell me where poetry comes from. Before the days of men, the gods would war, but their war would destroy the entire universe, so there must be a way to find peace. The gods of Vanaheim and the gods of Asgard agreed to a trade. From Vanaheim, they brought Dyrthyr, the god of the sea, Frey and Freya, god and goddess of beauty, and Odin, agreed to have all the gods spit into a bucket and turn that spit into a person. It, it made sense at the time. <laughs> Gavasir, the person created, was the smartest man who ever lived. And when the dwarves, Fjallar and Galar, found out, they wanted his intelligence. So they did the wisest thing they could think of, which was murder him and use his blood to make mead. <laughs> now, the Norse call this the mead of poetry, but let's call it what it is, blood mead, all right? So these guys loved their blood mead, and when the gods confronted them, hey, where's Kvasir? They said, oh, he drowned in his own wisdom. <laughs> Apparently they bought it. Um, so then they said, hey, we're pretty smart, and they decided to fight some giants and lost. Uh, so the giants took the mead from the two dwarves. It went to a giant named Sutung. Sutung realized that anyone who drunk this would become a great poet, so he gave it to his daughter Gunlauth to hide in a mountain, because apparently poetry is bad. Um, Odin heard about this and wanted this mead. So he flew over there, went to Sutung's brother, Bagi, and killed Bagi's servants. Then he goes to Bagi and says, I'll be your new servant if only I could have some of that mead. This made a lot of sense to Bagi. So he says, sure, I'll help you get that. Uh, he drilled a hole with Odin so Odin could find Gunlath's hiding place. And once Odin got in there, he made a deal with Gunlath. And he said, if you let me have a sip of that mead, I'll let you have sex with me. Now, this was apparently a really good deal because she let him have three sips. 
<sighs> Odin, being a god and all, by the time he had the third sip, he had drunk everything. So he skedaddled. He uh, turned into an eagle and flew off back to Asgard, where he baby birded the mead back into a goblet so that humans could enjoy it and, you know, become poets. Unfortunately, he swallowed some of the mead and it fell out the back end. If you accidentally drink any of the butt dropped blood mead, then you become a bad poet. <laughs> Don't drink anything that came out of a butt. <laughs> All right. Now, Bragi says to Aegir, don't feel bad for Gunlauf, because Odin gave her a gift on his way out. Nine months later, she gave birth to Bragi, the god of poetry. So Aegir apparently liked this story, but the thing that the gods really love doing while drunk is insult battles. For example, Loki one time's like, oh yeah, well, Hymir's daughters used Njorther's mouth as a toilet, to which Njorther responded, I'm only here to stop a war, plus no one hates my kids. Njorther is not good at insult battles. <laughs> Loki, however, on a winning streak, decides to keep going and says, oh, by the way, guys, you know how the world's going to end soon? It's my fault. The gods didn't think it was funny. After that, they all went after him. All right, well, there you go. We have gods of drunkenness, sky fathers turning into eagles, goddesses turning into plants, and a whole lot of random murder. Um, beyond that, questions? Do you think when they, when these, I mean, was, this is an oral tradition we're talking about, was it, um, do you think these stories were important, or do you think it was just like, sort of, tra you know, they liked the gods to be trashy, right, and I can imagine they, they were they drinking while trashy. they were, while they were drinking while they were telling stories, so. What I love about a lot of these older religions is they just love the idea that the gods, while more powerful and just generally better than them, were just crazy, crazy, crazy beings. So they would tell stories about them getting drunk, stories about them uh, sleeping with the wrong person, stories about them cross-dressing, stories about them doing whatever. Uh, and it was a religion. So they would pray to them and then next tell a story about when Odin pooped on somebody. So We have a, a Twitter question. Oh. Hey, so Heimdall had nine moms. How does that work? <laughs> Magic. What, what the, with the gods, a lot of these things are just stories that have been told so many times you kind of go with it, and it becomes just, okay, he had nine moms, sure. I see a question right there? So was there any particular deity that has just out of all of what you've read the most uh, just hilarious, entertaining stories? What's your favorite? Ooh. I can't choose a favorite child. <laughs> um, uh, generally, uh, what, my favorite pantheon, so to speak, generally the Mesoamerican one, Aztec and Mayan pantheons just overlap. They're basically the same as, as what you'd see with Greek and Roman, where they have most of the same gods, but the m later ones will have some newer gods added. And for that reason, they tend to have the craziest combinations. So the idea of, for example, 400 different gods of drunkenness is just great. But they also have a god of suicide, because why not? Um, and you just have random, random things you wouldn't think they'd have gods of. So I like that randomness aspect of it. Uh, in terms of stories, um, we don't have as many written down for the Aztecs and Mayans. We have, you know, oral tradition for a lot of that and some of the codexes that weren't burned. But for the Norse, we have those giant epic poems. We have those for the Greeks too, but the Norse just tend to be a little bit more fun, you know? Say again? Which god would win a drinking contest? Which god would win a drinking contest? Um, really, it depends on, depends on whose story you're telling. So... Thor, generally speaking, is always going to be the coolest god around, unless this is also a story where Odin's having some fun. So, generally speaking, Thor would win a drinking contest, unless Odin's also competing, you know? Uh, for the Aztecs, uh, it wasn't so much about, you know, who could outdo somebody else, it was about what you were doing after you got drunk and why you got drunk. But for the Norse, it was about, I'm just a better drinker than you. Oh, by the way, I love this, by the way. When the Greeks and the Romans get drunk, that's killing and debauchery. When the Aztecs and the Mayans get drunk, it's, you know, cannibalism and skinning people. But when the Norse get drunk, telling insults and poetry. <laughs> Who would have thought the Vikings were the peaceful ones? I say hand over here. Okay, I, I figured this would have to come up at some point. I have a, I have a confession to make. I don't drink. <laughs> 
My thing is I act drunk all the time. So if I drank and he, you know, I actually thought about bringing some root beer up so I could fit in, but yeah. So to answer your question, uh, Thor, <laughs> because I would just love to see him drunk. Whereas the Aztecs, if they get drunk, they're going to skin me. So. This is Nerd Night. We all fit in. Okay, one Someone more question. In the middle right had a question. I got a couple answers to that. First, I referenced 300 a minute ago. Um, I actually really like 300 in that I feel it is extremely accurate. By that I mean, if the Greeks were telling their own stories, they would have been like, we were the greatest of all warriors and our enemies were the giants of all monsters and they were the most, and that's how they would tell their story. So I think in that sense, it is extremely accurate. On the flip side, I really love Apocalypto uh, because while it is not entirely a uh, accurate to the Mayans, it has this kind of mishmash of Mayans and Aztecs and a bunch of other stuff, it is, I was going to say the best, but probably the only real representation of Mesoamerica, which is one of my favorite fields, on the screen. And they did a really good job to the point that I have been kind of teaching myself a little of this language, and on the background there was like graffiti written in Mayan, and I was like, I can read that. That says Jaguar. <laughs> that's, it. that's all I could read. Um, so, so in those two senses, we have the Apocalypto, which did a really good job in an exaggerated way of showing realism, and then 300, which, shows, which does a really great job of showing basically how they would tell their own story. All right, all right I don't see a hand, but I hear you. What's up? Four hundred really wasn't a big number for any of those things. So two things on that. One, I, I don't do numbers. <laughs> no, uh, long time ago, they came out with Talking Barbie, and she said numbers hurt my brain. I, I agree with her. Um, but but number two, uh, I I am kind of teaching myself some of these old languages, but I definitely don't speak or translate them. So I am relying on many many researchers, and and basically the consensus of all the researchers that I've read is that when they say four hundred. By the way, this is the difference between researchers that are just going to try to translate to English and then researchers that are like, let me interpret. All the ones that interpret have said, whenever they say 400, they really mean a really big number. Uh, because there's many, many examples of 400 that you can see pop up in uh, Mayan and Aztec and Zapotec and Toltec. You see those, that number 400 pop up over and over again. And it was almost never about a specific, these 400 people. Uh-oh, one extra, he didn't count anymore. It was just, it was a really big number. Um, so I'm, tra I'm trusting them, taking, I'm taking their word on that. Um, the ones that translate directly, just, you know, 400. I mentioned the 400 youths in the um, um, Popova, the considered to be the Mayan Bible. Uh, the heroes go to reven get revenge for these 400 youths that die, and at the end, those 400 youths become the 400 stars of the, of the Milky Way. So 400 just keeps popping up. Okay. Question in the middle. Uh, it, it is a hobby of mine. It's one that I've been passionate about most of my life. I was going to say all of it, but when I was a little kid, I wanted to be a paleontologist, so jumped over. Um, but um, but I have, I have uh, part of my master's degree involves uh, anthropology and other stuff, and this is where I like to focus that. So definitely not an expert, but I love talking about it. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you.